Good morning. morning. I'm Lisa Burby, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm the worship associate this morning, and I welcome you on this gorgeous day, and hopefully you got an extra hour of sleep. Well, good. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Huntington. A special welcome to those of you who are watching us on Zoom or later on YouTube. I'd like to extend a special welcome today to newcomers and visitors. And if you are new to our congregation and want to speak with someone to learn more about us, please visit our membership table in the social hall or speak with one of the greeters that you met on the way in. And know that whoever you are, whomever you love, and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Today our guest speaker is Serena martin Lagori. She serves as Executive Director of New Hour for Women and Children, an organization dedicated to empowering mothers, women, and children impacted by incarceration. New Hour provides programs with Long Island, within Long Island's three jails and provides reentry support to those returning home from after concert incarceration. Serena oversees and leads carceral reform across New York State through advocacy and policy reform efforts. Prior to leaving New Hour, she was the executive director of Her Story Writers Workshop. Serena served as associate director of policy at the Correctional Association of New York's Women in Prison Project, where she spearheaded legislative initiate, initiatives and policy advocacy addressing prison reform. She was the key organizer of a successful effort to create the Adoption and Safe Families Act Expanded Discretion Law, which works to secure parental rights for incarcerated parents as well as the anti-shackling law, which prohibits the shackling of incarcerated mothers during labor. Serena is a survivor of isolated confinement, received her associate degree in, in the college-bound program at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility, and her bachelor's degree from Adelphi University. Serena serves an, on Governor Hochul's New York State Domestic Violence Task Force as a regional co-chair, serves on the Suffolk County Welfare to Work Task Force. She doesn't do much. <laughs> Co-led the Justice for Women COVID-19 Task Force, along with the, women, the WCGA, and serves on the Suffolk County Police Reform and Reinvention Task Force. She is the recipient of the 2018 Citizens Against Recidivism Award, the 2022 Houses on the Moon Layton Award, and the 2023 Islip Town NAACP Award. And she enjoys family, or preparing her family's favorite Puerto Rican meals when she has any downtime. <laughs> Welcome, Serena. And right now, we're going to hear the opening words written by Angela Davis and Miriam Caba. Our reader is Amanda Acevedo, yes. Acevedo, New Hours Director of Services and Reentry. Welcome to you as well, Amanda. Thanks so much. Uh, Angela Davis said, jails and prisons are designed to break human beings, to convert the population into specimens in a zoo, obedient to our keepers, but dangerous to each other. Also reading some words by Mariam Kaba. It's work to be hopeful. It's not like a fuzzy fe feeling, like you have to actually put in energy, time, and you have to be clear-eyed, and you have to hold fast to having a vision. It's a hard thing to maintain, but it matters to have it, to believe that it's possible to change the world. You know that we don't live in a predetermined, predestined world where like nothing we do has an impact. No, no, that's not true. Change is, in fact, constant. Our opening hymn is going to be number 318, We Would Be One, Stand As You Are Able. The words will be on the screen.
my son James will help us light the chalice, the symbol of our faith. Our chalice lighting today is from a child of an incarcerated parent through the New York Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents. It's titled, Cell Block, Dad, by Anonymous. Across from me sat a stranger. My mind could only focus on the scrapes that echoed from the inmate's metal chair. I didn't recognize the coarse hands that had never rocked me to sleep or the mouth that had never wished me good luck. The plastic mirror separating us wasn't needed for the emotional barrier had already formed. His eyes pleaded with me to pick up the phone. As I grabbed it, I felt my walls begin to crack and hands begin to shake. The thousands of unsaid words my dad left behind had finally reached my ear. As with every week, we start with announcements because this is a very busy congregation. And I'm happy to announce that despite four rainy weekends, the seventh annual pumpkin patch has been a success. We sold over 20, wait, you haven't even heard the good news. We sold over $28,000 worth of pumpkins. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm not done, people. As well as nearly 2,400 in mums and donations. So our final profit for the 2023 season was almost $10,000. So now you can... <laughs> The greatest factor behind our success has been the increased support from the UFH congregation. And we had the participation from 65 families with 104 individual volunteers. So there's going to be a little bit of a celebration in the social hall today after the service. And I've heard it involves pumpkins. <laughs> Who knew? Also after the service at noon, the ministerial search committee will be sharing the results of the congregational survey in an in-person cottage meeting. Today is um, an opportunity to learn about this and engage in deeper conversation about who we are, who we want to be, and what we're looking for in our next minister. The meeting starts right here at noon in this room, and you're welcome to join even if you didn't register in advance, and child care will be provided. And then there is one more Zoom meeting this Wednesday at 7.30, and a link will be provided in an email soon. Next Sunday, November 12th, Reverend Deborah will hold a brief dedication of our new wind phone in the Memorial Garden at 9.45 a.m., as discussed in last week's service, which you can see on YouTube if you missed it. You can get all the details in this week's flash and on our website. If you don't yet get our weekly newsletter every Thursday in your inbox, you can sign up on our homepage at uufh.org. And now, I invite us all to settle into our bodies, quiet our minds as we breathe deeply together and settle into our time of worship. Please join me in saying our mission statement. The words will be on the screen. In religious community, we nurture our individual spirits through caring for one another and helping to heal the world. Now is the time in our service where we invite you to light a candle for something deep in your heart. Doretha Hirsch, today's pastoral care associate, will join us at the candles in the front and has a basket for cards that you can write joys and concerns that you'd like to be shared with the congregation. She also has um, blank cards and pens if you'd like to write something now. And as Isabella plays, I invite you to come forward or to the candles in the back. <laughs>
So we have some wonderful joys to share today. Amy and Lars Olander are thrilled to announce the marriage of their daughter on October 21st. Emily and Cody James were married in Auburn, New York, just north of their home near Ithaca. It was truly a wonderful weekend filled with love of friends and family. Peggy Coolius has shared that Melanie Coolius married Anthony Chapa on Friday, November 3rd. Both Melanie and Emily grew up in this congregation, so it's a wonderful joy to be able to wish them well in their new marriages. I lit a candle for Steve, who's home recovering from surgery and hopefully watching me right now. <laughs> and also for my grandmother, for, who was born on this day in 1910. We have other news to share. We have a card that says, I pray for world peace. Wonderful. I had the pleasure last night of enjoying the otherworldly music sung by Evoco Choir that our own Maria Nielsen is a part of, Christina. All the runners and volunteers at the New York City Marathon today, especially Bill, keep them safe. Let's take a moment to contemplate all the names shared aloud, as well as those written on our hearts. Let us open our minds and hearts to the place of quiet, to the silent prayer for the healing of pain and the soft, gentle coming of love. I invite, oh, I'm sorry, spirit of life, please. <laughs> there always has to be one glitch in every service. It's a rule. <laughs> invite our children and youth to come forward and sit in the first row, actually, so you can watch a wonderful video. Millie, you can stay in the first row, and all the children can please join her and James. We're going to watch a video of the book Visiting Day by Jacqueline Woodson, and then we're going to chat a little bit afterwards. Visiting Day by Jacqueline Woodson, illustrated by James E. Ransom. Only on visiting day is there chicken frying in the kitchen at 6 a.m. and grandma humming soft and low, smiling her secret just for daddy and me smile. And me lying in bed, smiling my just for grandma and daddy smile. There's grandma doing her hair up. And maybe daddy is already up, brushing his teeth, combing his hair back, saying, yeah, that pretty little girl of mine is coming today with all the men around him looking on jealous like, because they wish they had a little girl of their own coming. Only on visiting day does Mrs. Tate come over when the sky is still pink, heavy with presents for her son Thomas saying, Please, can you take these with you? And Grandma taking the presents from Mrs. Tate's arms and shooting me a look that says, you better not make a sound about Mrs. Tate not having money to take the bus up there to see her only son. And I sit quiet, respectful, 
Only on visiting day do I stand patiently at the bus stop, holding tight to Grandma's hand until everybody's inside. They're boarding the bus now. And we're all passing around fried chicken, cornbread, and thick slices of sweet potato pie until maybe we think we're going to pop. But instead, I go to sleep and don't wake up again until the bus pulls up in front of the big old building where, as Grandma puts it, Daddy is doing a little time. And only on visiting day do I get to tell Daddy everything that has happened over the month while I sit in his lap and he pulls on my braids, smiling his big, me and Grandma have been gone forever, smile, laughing his big laugh, showing me and Grandma off to his friends, pressing peppermints into my hand and kisses against Grandma's cheek. Grandma says it's not forever going to be like this. She says one day we'll be able to wake up and have Daddy right there in our house again and we won't have to take long bus rides once a month and walk home from the bus stop hand in hand feeling a little sad already starting to miss Daddy. Grandma says all it takes is time, a little time. And while we're holding out waiting for Daddy to come home, we can count our blessings and love each other up and make biscuits and cakes and pretty pictures to send Daddy. And in the early evening, if it's a little chilly outside, we can sit out back bundled up in blankets and make each other laugh as we make big plans for when Daddy comes home again. Have you ever done something special for someone you missed? Like, what have you done? Oh, you tell your friends you have a surprise for them. That's a nice thing to do when you miss somebody. How about anyone else? Anyone else do something for somebody they miss? No? Well, I know someone. I have a friend named Amanda who can tell us what she did when she was missing her daddy. Amanda, would you like to come down and talk to us? So a lot like the girl in the video you guys watched, I was a little girl whose uh, dad was incarcerated. And so one of the things that I did when I missed him was send him cards and pictures that I drew for him and also speak to him on the phone. Um, and similarly to her, who she went to visit her dad, I also visited my dad while he was away. Um, and what stood out to me was her talking about being on her dad's lap, right? So like what my dad would do is he would put me on his lap and then shake his leg really, really fast and say that like he was a horse and that when he came home, we were gonna go horseback riding together and we did. And now um, my dad's been home a really long time. Thank you for sharing that, Amanda. <laughs> So now I'd like to sing our children and youth to their classroom, and Ms. Sandra will take you with for, to your classes. Thank you. Each week we have a collection for our split plate program. That means that undesignated donations are split between the UUFH and our charity of the month, unless you indicate otherwise. This month we're supporting the International Rescue Committee. Committee. <laughs> the recent events have shaken the Middle East and the wider world. As a humanitarian organization, the International Rescue Committee stands on the side of those in need. Civilians are suffering and in peril because they are trapped amid a war. 
The humanitarian imperative and the principles of neutrality and partiality, independence and humanity, which drive us forward, have never been more needed. Please help as you're able. Ushers will be passing the baskets while Isabella plays. And for those of you at home, you can send a check to the office or donate through the website. Thank you, everyone, for your support, for the work that we do within and beyond these walls. Mother to Son by Langston Hughes. Well, son, I'll tell you. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I've been climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you set down on the steps because you'll feel it's kind of hard. Thank you, Jaretha. Before we hear from our speaker, the short clip you're about to see is from a much longer video about New Hour for Women and Children. To see the full video, you can visit their website at newhourli.org. Good morning. It is so wonderful to be here with each of you today. 
Um, you've heard a little bit about New Hour, and I'd like to take a moment to just thank my incredible staff who is here. These are women who are tireless in their efforts to support people behind bars. Danielle Donovan, who leads our jail programming behind bars. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> Bria, Bria Agard, who is our case manager, who works one-on-one -on -one with women coming home to the community. Thank you, Bria. Car Caroline Hansen, who is here and is our adv advocacy director, and we lift up her husband, who is behind bars. <laughs> and you've met Amanda, who spoke so beautifully before, our <laughs> director of social work. I'd also like to thank my son, who is missing a soccer game this morning to be here. <laughs> thank you, James. Um, I come to this work when I founded New Hour eight years ago with a small group of volunteers. Maybe some of you volunteer. I met someone here today who actually volunteered with us when we first began. I see you. Um, and part of the reason we founded New Hour was because people coming home after incarceration or even being detained in our jails didn't have any support. And I was one of those people. I came home from prison at 22 years old. My son wasn't born, that, born then, so I don't know what it's like to have been a mother behind bars, but I saw mothers behind bars, and I know what they struggled with. When we first founded New Hour, it was really to think about how do we, as a community, come together to support people who have done harm, but are now doing more. And the solution is not throwing away the key and locking people up forever and ever. It is about how do we create a system that allows people to have the support that they need when they're facing mental illness, substance abuse, trauma, when they have survived harm. And I'm reminded of Mariam Kaba, who we heard a little bit of her words from before, but she's really driven much of my own development as a thought leader and actually as an abolitionist. And I'm gonna share the inspiration for my sermon today, which is from her words. Hope is a discipline. But she goes beyond that. She goes beyond that to talk about the fact that hope is a discipline coupled with action, movement, growth, and it's beyond the only choices that society often gives us to deal with harm. There's punishment, there's vengeance, there's imprisonment. But her full statement is that hope is a discipline. It is when you say, what would we do without prisons? What we're really saying is, what would we do without civil death, exploitation, and state-sanctioned violence. I survived that violence. Many and most women and men behind bars will face violence behind bars. And I'm often reminded of my dear, dear friend, Barbara Allen, who followed me through my journey into prison and home from prison. And she said, if you lock up an animal who's caged, and leave them there for years and years, what do you get when you open that gate? A wild animal that's been caged for years and years. So while we have the system that we have in place, we as New Hour think about how do we create space for healing? How do we bring education, support? How do we bring hope into very dark places? And that's exactly what Bria and Danielle and Amanda and Daphne, who's not here right now, do each week in the Suffolk County Jail. We're lucky to have Sheriff Toulon, who believes in programs, believes in rehabilitation. We run 15 programs a week in the jails, behind bars for women who never, you may never get to meet or know the way we've gotten to meet or know them. New Hour works within a system of oppression. We do, but the aim is that eventually that system will be eliminated, lessened, lowered, 
and eventually gotten rid of. We think about the women at Rosie's, which is the women's jail at Rikers Island. We hear the stories, we see the press, and what we know is that prisons don't create healing. They simply create more harm. But how do we hold people accountable? As someone who also created harm, how do I give back to my community? The answer came to me through a dear, dear friend who's since passed away, Sister Elaine Roulette. She was a mentor, a sister of St. Joseph, and really, truly a mother to me. And when we think about the people in our lives who give us hope and resilience, who pours into us, who gives us what we need to continue on in the face of loss, shame, trauma, those are the challenges that we face, and the people who stand beside us during those times are true heroes. And that was Sister Elaine. She used to trudge up the hill in Bedford, which is the maximum women's prison. I was 20, and I was there for three years. And she seemed to know something that many of us didn't know, that these prison walls weren't here to help us, but her love and joy and support was something that we looked forward to and that we held on to and that we created a community behind bars. I once had a senator ask me, what are women behind bars? Who are they? What do they look like? Maybe you're just different. And I said, look around you. Take a look at any person you see sitting to your left or right. We all look the same. It is simply what got you there? What were the systems of oppression? What were the instances in which our community failed you? Maybe your mental health crisis wasn't addressed and you made bad choices. I think a lot about why people end up in prison and jail. It's what we do at New Hour. We think about how do we bring hope to others after this. The work that we do is based not just on big ideas, but on true, tangible support. I'm thinking of a woman who walked through our doors this past week, sat with Amanda for two hours, and she had been in prison for 15 years. She returned to a shelter with no family, no support, no money, no ID, no transportation. And then you wonder, how do we keep our community safe when we allow people to come home with nothing but desperation? And that is where New Hour steps in, with food, with clothing, with technology, with support, with transportation. I also think about how do we offer an alternative to violence, to harm, and to this desperation? Another dear, dear friend of mine, Kathy Boudin, who was the first formerly incarcerated person to build and run the Center for Justice at Columbia University. And she took me aside in the prison yard as a kid. And she talked to me about what it is to give to your community, what it is to be part of a community. And it, I realized very quickly that community is truly the key to New Hour's work. It is truly the key to hope for all of us. Because often it's very easy to get caught up in just your family, just your nuclear family. And as we know, families let us down, families disappoint. Sometimes the families we are born into are not our families of choice. When we look beyond nuclear families, we do think about and we teach this at New Hour to our women coming home, the true blessing is being able to give to the community, being able to give back and to find ways to bridge the gap between all of us. I think a lot about the times when I'm most happy, and while I'm, ha <clears throat> while I'm happy at home and I'm happy making my arroz con gandules for my son and having him cook in the kitchen with me, the happiest times are when I can welcome a woman home into our community, when I can say, welcome back, what do you need? What can we do for you? And so when we think about our options, now when war is on our minds, when things are 
heavy and pressing and hurt, I think beyond the options that we typically have, war, prison, only one or two options, either or. And we know that life operates beyond the either or. It is the and. It is how do we hold both things to be true. It is supporting each other and thinking beyond just the choices that the media or our community gives us or our families give us or our, what we grew up with has given us. Mariam Kaba talks about moving beyond restorative justice, which is a good thing to restore justice, to make amends, to take responsibility for harm, and we believe in accountability for harm done. But what do you do with that? Because many people have said, even though the person who harmed me is locked away forever, I don't feel any better. We believe in transform transformative justice, which is really, truly the next step in restorative justice. It is how we as a community come together to hold both things to be true, that someone can have caused deep and serious harm and must take accountability for that harm, but that we as a community must also think about how the systems that we have in place have played into what created those choices. I'd like to end with something that Sister Elaine did at every every sermon she ever gave, any group she ever ran, and she ran support groups. I was there with her running them for the mentally ill behind bars, for women who had tried to commit suicide, for women who um, were really at the very hardest sp spots in their life. And she would do this in her prayer group, in her reentry group. She would say, let's bring down the graces. So if you will uh, go along with me, I would like you to join me as we pull the graces with our hands down from heaven. Whatever you believe in, whoever you believe in, whether it's universe or God or anything up there, pull those graces down, pull them down, and give them out to everyone you see. Throw the grace around, grace and blessings to everyone you see. <laughs> Throw grace around, and then hold some grace especially close to your heart for you because the most important person in your life is you. You are the one who holds the key to all of the love and hope that we need. So with that, I would like to close and thank you and offer you hope to continue to change the world around you. Thank you. If here you have found freedom, take it with you into the world. If you have found comfort, go and share it with others. If you have dreamed dreams, help one another that they may come true. If you have known love, give some back to a bruised and hurting world.
Thank you, Isabella. Thank you again to Serena and Amanda for your wonderful speaking this morning. Unfortunately, since they have another event to run to, they won't be able to speak with you today. But they did. there are materials on the back window ledge so that you can learn more about New Hour. They are always taking donations. One of the things that Serena told me um, when she was here once before is that uh, women in prison don't get full bottles of anything, do they? No shampoo, they get little tiny packets. Nothing. It's nothing. So it, what may seem like a small thing to you, a full bottle of shampoo and other items would be incredibly helpful for you to donate. Um, and we've taken up collections before, so perhaps we'll do that again really soon. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, so again, grab some materials. Um, I wish everyone at home a good day and invite those of you here in the main hall to coffee hour in the social hall for the pumpkin patch celebration and then be back here at noon for the search committee meeting and have a wonderful day.